Here's the question. Here we go. What is one word that comes to your mind when you think of God's love? What is one word that comes to your mind when you think of God's love? There's no wrong answer there. Well, actually, I guess there would be if you say he's not. Um, that's wrong because that's two words and it's not true. Um, someone say, just give some answers out loud. Give me a word. Grace, amazing, unlimited, everlasting, cross, steadfast, reachable, good, undeserved, patience, yeah, excellent. I want us to think about that. I want us to get that locked in our minds because that's really the core of this morning's message. God's love for us and the fact that he loves us as his children. Well, speaking of children, sometimes children do stupid things. Um, and when I was a child, well, let's be honest, I still do stupid things, but... Um, when I was a child, I loved doing stupid things. I, I love to swim. I love water. Um, and I had family in Southern California who lived close to the beach. So growing up, I would, every year, I would spend quality time in Southern California on the beach. And um, that would mean my diving headfirst into the ocean and going out and swimming. Does anyone here ever swam in the ocean? You know what that's like? Uh, so you know what that's like. You know it's a lot of fun. And one of the things that I love to do, I, was, I never learned how to surf. I wish I'd learned how to surf. I would have been cool. My cousin surfs, he loves it. I never learned how. The closest I would come is either getting on a bodyboard or the other thing I would do, and this is kind of marginally dumb, is um, I would go out to the waves and I would kind of race them, right? I would swim ahead of them. Now, knowing full well that I'm not going to win, and that wasn't the goal. The goal was to catch a wave that was coming fast enough and was strong enough that it would grab me and just push me in towards the shore. And it was this kind of exhilarating feeling because I was out of control. This wave was so much more powerful than I was, but it was also exhilarating because I was going so much faster than I could ever go just swimming on my own power. What I want to suggest is that picture of being caught by a wave and being pushed forward is not a bad picture of what we find in Ephesians 5. We are going to find that God's love grabs us and moves us. You see, if we're really honest and we look at the passage that Lauren just read for us, and we look at the commands in this passage, if we really take seriously what these commands are saying, then we would immediately admit there is no way we have the power to do this. How in the world can we imitate God? How in the world can we love like Jesus? Trying to do that on our own power is like trying to swim on my own as fast as a wave. It is just not possible. But that's not what this passage is asking us to do as we dig into it. It is showing us how we are moved how we are empowered by the love of God that we then pass on to others. This passage is really about taking what God is doing and sharing it. And we do this by reflecting a certain kind of love and by rejecting a certain kind of love. But for us to really kind of get into this passage, it's helpful as we do each week to step back and reorient ourselves to what is going on in the book of Ephesians. 
Now, as you know, if you've been um, with us for any length of time, the book of Ephesians is divided into two halves. The first half of Ephesians is all about what God has done. And it's only in the second half of Ephesians that you get into the commands and the things that we are supposed to do, that the Ephesians are supposed to do. And that's because, as is always the case, what we do is a response to what God has done. Now, we are in the second half of Ephesians. We're in the section that is about what the Ephesians do and, by extension, what we do. If you've been paying attention, and you would have to have really been paying attention to catch this, since we started the second half, back at the beginning of chapter 4, what we have actually seen is Paul has been giving instructions on how to walk. And Paul has actually already said two things about walking. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And he's going to develop that from verse 1 through verse 16 to talk about we must walk in unity with one another. That's what it means to walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling. Now remember, as we've said, as we've gone through this, when Paul talks about walking, all he's doing is using a figure of speech to talk about how we live daily life how we go about our daily routines, our daily functions. And he is saying in verses 1 through 16 of chapter 4 that we must live daily life in unity with one another. In verse 17, he brings up the whole subject of walking again and says we must no longer walk as the Gentiles. And he's going to develop that statement through verse 32 of chapter 4. And his point is we must walk in holiness we must reflect the character of God. And so he starts off in this section about what we must do by saying we must live daily life in unity with one another. And we must live daily life holy with God. And as we start chapter 5, what Paul does is give us the third way to walk. And what he says is we must walk in love. And he develops this with a charge that we must reflect Jesus' loves, but we must reject self-love. Verses 1 and 2 are where we see the charge to reflect Jesus' love. Now you notice that the passage starts off with the word therefore. It's referring back to what he's just said in chapter 4. And at the end of chapter 4, what he is talking about is God's grace as seen through sending Jesus to bring forgiveness. And so what he's going to say is, the, is a logical conclusion. It's the natural follow-up to the fact that we have received God's grace through Christ. So because we have seen God's grace through Christ, command number one, be imitators of God. Command number two, walk in love. These are your two commands at the heart of this passage. To be an imitator of God, the word that's used there refers to being an impersonator. It actually refers to being an actor. And the idea is someone would, would so take on the mannerisms of, of another person that when you see that actor, you would think you are seeing that a real person. So Paul is saying, we must so take on the mannerisms, the thinking, the character of God, that when people see us, what they are thinking they are seeing is the very character and nature of God himself. And walking in love is basically how we do that. It's the principle that we apply to be imitators of God. We must live lives that are characterized by the same kind of love as Christ loved us. The same kind of love that Jesus loved us with. And here's how he describes that love. He gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. I don't want to assume that everyone grew up in church. So if you didn't grow up in church, this language may be foreign to you. What in the world is Paul talking about? We actually have been singing about it this morning. And again, if you didn't grow up in church, it probably sounded weird to you. So let me explain what he's talking about. What he is saying is that all of us, and this is the core message of the Bible, every single one of us have been 
are regularly in rebellion against God. That's what the Bible calls sin. And because of that, we are separated from God. There is a price to pay for that rebellion. But what God did because he loved us is he sent his son Jesus to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, to pay the penalty that we should pay that keeps us separated from God. And he was raised three days later from the grave and that same power that raised him from the dead gives us new life. That is how Christ loved us. He gave himself up for us on a cross to take a penalty that we owed and he paid it himself. And when it says it's a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God, the point of that is that his sacrifice worked. His death was effective. God was pleased. How does Jesus love us? He loves us by pursuing relationship with us and pursuing our good, even at the ultimate sacrifice. Be imitators of God. Walk in love. What is that? To love others just as Christ loved us, to pursue their good, to pursue relationship, even at a high price. Well, how in the world can we do this? What empowers us to do this? What motivates us to do this? This is the key to the whole passage. As beloved children. It's interesting when I, there's nothing wrong with this, but what I usually think of is, oh, I'm supposed to do the right things and be obedient to God because I love him, and that's, that's true. But that's not what Paul's saying here. Paul turns it around. He says, be imitators of God. Love others as Christ. Why? How? Because you are loved. You are loved as his beloved children. We are to reflect the character of God because of how God loves us as his children. I want you to stop and think for a second. I want you to picture in your mind the best moment, or pick one, a great moment that you had with mom and dad. A great moment where you felt loved, you felt cared for, you felt enjoyed A great moment where you knew deep down in your soul that mom or dad loved you. And as you think about that moment, as you lock that moment in your mind, what I want to tell you is that best moment that you ever had where you experienced the joy and care and compassion and protection and delight of your parents, that best moment is only an imperfect shadow of God's love for you. Paul is saying, because you are beloved by God as his child, that is what empowers you, and that is what motivates you to imitate him and to love others as Christ loved you. A few years ago, we went through the process of um, caring for Anne's mother while she died. And during that season... Anne's mother lived in Dallas. During that season, Anne would drive to Dallas every week, multiple times a week, very often have to stay there multiple days. And she would try to come back and be wife and mom and all of that. And it was just, it was really, it was very challenging for her. And one of her friends who lives in Dallas, um, with, with very good motives, it was very appropriate, challenged her a little bit. I said, why are you doing all of this? Are you doing all of this because you feel guilty? Are you doing all of this because you have a savior complex and you think that that it's up to you to take care of your mom? Anne's response was, um, no. No, that's not why I'm putting myself through this. I'm putting myself through this because my mother loved me well. 
and I have received love from her in ways that are beyond my imagination. And now I have the opportunity to love her back. Be imitators of God because you are beloved, perfectly loved. No one will love you the way that God loves you. And that is what drives us and enables us to be like God. That is the wave that catches us and moves us. So here's your hard question. How much of your identity is defined by you are a beloved child of God? Let me ask a different question. I've used this terminology before. What is your lead identity? And I want to challenge you to make the fact that you are God's beloved child your lead identity. And your lead identity is what most defines who you are. And there are a lot of things that compete to be our lead identity. Dad, mom, wife, friend, worker, husband, student, child. Those are the things that compete to define us for who we are. To say, who I am at my core is a student, or who I am at my core is a child, or who I am at my core is an athlete, or who I am at my core is, is a father. And if you define yourself, if your lead identity is anything other than being a beloved child of God, you are going to be enslaved to that identity. Because the second that identity is challenged, the second that identity is taken away from you, the second that identity changes, you are going to be lost and have no idea what to do. It will destroy you and it will damage the people around you. But the role of beloved child of God never changes. God never loves you less than it is possible for him to love you and it is possible for him to love you perfectly. Your role of beloved child of God never changes. God never loves you less than the perfect love with which he loves you right now. So here's some questions to help you identify what really is your lead identity. Ask yourself the question, what role that you play gives you the most pride? What role in life gives you the greatest sense of self-worth? What role in life do you care most about your reputation in? And as you think through those questions, it will start to reveal what role in your life do you most define yourself by? You are first and foremost a beloved child of God. And that same love that you receive from God through Christ is meant to overflow to others. And Paul continues by showing the, the other side of this, that that love will not overflow from our lives unless we reject love of self. And that's what he picks up starting in verse 3. Sexual immorality is just really referring to any type of, of sexual sin, of sex outside of marriage. It's easy to think that that's also what all impurity is referring to, but it's actually a much broader term than that. It's a term that applies to anything that we do that would be morally impure. It, it, it could be our motives. So it could be something that we, we do that's really good, but we're doing it for selfish motives or wrong motives. It's a mindset or an attitude that we don't care what God thinks. We care more about what I think or what others think. Covetous, that's just another way of talking about greed, but it's a greed that is never satisfied. It is an extreme self-focus. What I'd actually like to suggest is all three of those are really about self-focus. Right? Sexual immorality is about treating someone else as an object. For my good. Impurity is saying, I don't care what the standard is. 
I'm going to do what I want to do. And covetousness is trying to gain or keep things that are important to me just because they are important to me. And when Paul says they should not even be named among you, he is saying these things shouldn't even be a topic of conversation. They should be so absent from your life and the life of the church that there is simply no reason to talk about them. In verse 4, he actually talks about what we talk about. Let there be no filthiness. This was a word for shameful. It's not caring how what you say affects the people around you. Foolish talk is the idea of, of talk that is senseless. Talk that adds no value. I was trying to think about what's an example of that from my life. And that's a bad thing to do when you write a sermon. Because then it gets really convicting. And I'm not going to say this is true for you because I might risk stepping on your toes. But it was true for me. You know what came to my mind? Venting. Venting. At least as I do it. Because it accomplishes nothing. Right? And if I'm venting about someone to someone else, I'm certainly not speaking about that person with love, grace, and mercy. And at the end, I don't really feel any better about the whole situation. It is truly senseless, pointless talk. Now, we all think we know what crude joking means, but it's actually not referring to jokes you shouldn't tell you shouldn't say in front of your mother or anyone else what it's referring to and this will be convicting jokes that put people down jokes hu using humor to hurt people or to embarrass people do you see once again with these three things there is the same theme of self-focus. There is the, the shameless talking that doesn't care what other people think or how it affects them. There is senseless talking that does nothing but makes you feel better maybe for the moment. And then there is this humor at other people's expense that the best it does is make you feel more important or better about yourself in the moment. It's all about self-focus. And then right at the end of this verse, it gives what self-focus should be replaced with. Thanksgiving. Self-focused needs to be replaced with thanksgiving. How does that work? Why does that make sense? Why does he say thanksgiving as a replacement for this? Because you can't give thanks unless you are content. And self-focus comes because we fear that we lack something or that we lose something that matters to us. Recognizing that contentment comes from being with God allows us to be thankful in a painful, fallen, broken world. The reason that we can be thankful is not just because we're experiencing this pain. It is because as we are experiencing the fallenness and brokenness of the world, we know that God has not abandoned us. God is with us and God walks with us through the situation. We replace self-focus with thanksgiving that is grounded in the contentment of knowing that we have life with God. Verse 5 draws the conclusion from verses 3 through 4. People that here are talking about here are people who are characterized by these issues. And when we first read this, this should be shocking to us. It says, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolatrous, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. And we read that and we say, oh no, because those terms are so broad... Everyone is included. 
And we look at this and say, what does this mean? Does this mean because I struggle with these things? That God wants nothing to do with me. Paul is addressing people who aren't struggling with these things. That's what he's talking about. These are people whose lead identity, what they think about themselves and what they want you to think about themselves is defined by sexual immorality. It's defined by impurity. It's defined by their greed and their self-centeredness. And when it says that they have no inheritance, it's basically saying these are people who are not in God's family. They do not receive the benefits now or in eternity of being a part of God's family. And if you think about it, that makes sense. This is not God just snubbing people. This is not God just saying, I'm not interested in having you around because you're not part of my group. This is people saying they are not interested in being a part of God's family because they are defined by these things. And they want to be defined by these things. Their identity is not tied to God's family and they don't want it to be. And God is not going to force them to be a part of his family. And then verse 6 contains a warning. You see, people in our society are going to tell us that it's okay to go through life self-focused and as a self-loving individual. And many people will tell you that you are crazy if you don't. Who else is going to watch out for you? And that advice from society is empty words that will deceive you. See, it is because of our self-centeredness and our self-focus that the wrath of God is displayed, is comes against all those who are disobedient. What is the wrath of God? The wrath of God is not just God being over the top angry for no good reason. It is God making right all the injustices and all the wrongs of the world. It is God stepping in and saying all the pain and all the damage that is caused by the self-centeredness, the self-focus that exists throughout this world is going to be dealt with and it is going to be washed away and it is going to be made right. That is God's wrath. And we will experience God's wrath, or maybe a better way of saying it is God's wrath is going to be poured out, is going to be displayed in one of two ways, and these are the only two options. Either we personally will be the recipients of God's wrath because we rightly deserve it for the pain that has been caused by our self-focus and self-centeredness. Or the wrath of God will be poured out on Christ on your behalf. And he will take the wrath and the punishment for all of our self-centeredness, all, all of your self-focus. The way that you make sure that it's the latter, that it is Christ taking the wrath, is that you repent and believe and follow Jesus, that you would be a part of his family. See, what Paul is doing is he is outlining two ways to live. You can imitate God and allow his love for you through Christ to overflow to others. Or you can live as someone who is self-focused. You can live as someone loved by God, or you can live as someone loved by self. And I want to wrap up by giving you a picture of what it looks like to imitate God's love. These are five principles that I think we find in this passage that will help us as we try to practically love others with the love of God. Over the last week and a half, two weeks, I have had multiple people in my office who are dealing with, I'll just use the word, abusive situations. 
Uh, in some cases, they are at work that it's happening. In some cases, it is extended family, and in some cases, it is within their own immediate family, within their own marriages. As I'm thinking about this passage in light of these conversations that, that I've had, so what, what do I say to them? What does Paul have to say to them in Ephesians 5? And I think these five things are really helpful. As God's beloved child, it is appropriate for them to name the wrong and the cost of that wrong against them. There are inappropriate ways to treat a beloved child of God. And when we are the recipients of those inappropriate ways, it is appropriate for us to say that is wrong and it costs us something. But Paul would go on to say in this passage, but our contentment doesn't depend on that situation and it doesn't depend on those people coming back and saying they were sorry. It doesn't depend on those people coming back and, and, and trying to fix things. Contentment doesn't depend on them. When we are discontent, it is because we think we lack something. But our wholeness comes from Christ. It comes from the fact that we are God's beloved children. And that's the only thing it depends on. We need to remember, and this is the context of this passage, that we are forgiven sinners. And so is the person who has hurt us. The reason we need to remember that is because that's what protects us against becoming arrogant and condescending towards the person who has hurt us. And then we need to give thanks that God is with us. He is the one making you whole. And it's worth stopping and asking and paying attention to how is it that God is doing that work in my life to make me whole right now. And that becomes a great thing to go back to him and say thank you about. And then this last point, just to clarify what we're not saying. To love someone means to desire unity with them and desire their good. But there are times... When desiring unity with someone and their good does not mean you're going to be close to them. We have a situation in our family where we have someone who is physically violent against my children. Grab them by the neck, pin them against the wall, and squeeze. Type of violent. And this is a family member. My children wisely say they love this person. They want unity with that person. What that means is no, we don't want conflict. We want to be able to get along. They genuinely want what's best for that person. But they will never be alone with that person. And they will never allow their children to be alone with that person. And that's appropriate. Desiring unity and good does not require us to act like what they have done doesn't happen, especially when our safety is at stake. Many of you know Ben Rimple. Ben has been a part of this church for a long time. And he is dying. And I have been to his house many times and spent a lot of time with him as he is approaching his last day. And when I was with him the other day, he made a comment to me. He said, being in the situation that he is in has caused him to learn a lot. And so I asked him the question, Ben, what are you, what are you learning? And what he said is the power, essentially, of reflecting the love of Christ, the power of living out this passage. And he described a situation to me that just blew me away. Years ago, there was a family in this church 
that he had a conflict with. And it sounds like there was, there was wrongs on both sides, that he didn't go into any details. It's just what I took away from it. And it sounds like there was real cost, I mean financial cost, significant financial cost on both sides. But what Ben and this family decided that they were going to do is they were not going to allow this conflict to keep them from being in relationship with each other. And so both families decided that they would not allow the wounds to fester. And that means that, that they would not try to get back what was lost on either side. They were going to intentionally spend time together and build a friendship. And it took time. It took years. It took patience. It took hard work to build trust. And as Ben is telling me this story, he says, you know, that family is now the closest friends that I have. And that family is over at my house. They are helping me. They are helping my family sacrificially, lovingly. That is the power of reflecting the love of Christ. You see, if they had decided to live out of self-love, their attitudes towards each other would have been selfish. Greed would have demanded that they get back what they lost. They would have said damaging things to each other and about each other, and they would have avoided each other. But that is not what they did. They walked in love. There was no need to get back what was lost because wholeness didn't depend on it. They had complete confidence in God's care for them as his children. And they recognized that God loved them sacrificially and pursued a relationship with them and pursued their good even when they didn't deserve it. And that's what they did with each other. And that is our challenge with one another. Are we willing to lead with our identity as God's beloved child? So the love we receive from God through Christ overflows to others. Are we willing to allow God's love to overflow, to move us, to love others the way that he loved us? These five principles that I put up there, these are not a magic formula to make life and relationships good. They are simply principles from this passage that help us replace self-love with a love for others that is based on how Christ loved us. And that is exactly Paul's point in this passage. Show the love that you have been given. When I think of truly loving someone the way that Jesus loved me, I think of the Rimples, and I think of this other family. Now I'm overwhelmed. I don't have the strength to sustain that kind of forgiveness, that patience, that trust to rebuild such a damaged relationship. I can't do that on my own. It seems like swimming against the ocean's current. I might be able to do it for a while, but eventually I'm going to wear out and I'm going to sink. But if I turn it around and come at it the other way, things look very different. If I start with the conviction that I am God's beloved child, and that is what I did that defines me and identifies me more than anything else, then I can be content because I know He is the one who cares for me. And when I grasp how deeply and undeservedly I have been loved, I feel gratitude and I do not feel like I have the right to withhold that love from anyone. Does that make sense? So how do we respond? Just a couple of ideas. As we say each week, dive into these passages, really absorb them. And a great way to do that is just to take the few moments and rewrite the passage in your own words. Can I tell you the highlight of my week a couple weeks ago? And this person has no idea this is coming, so this will be fun. When Jamie Reinhardt rewrote a passage and put it on Facebook... 
Be like Jamie. Rewrite the passage. Put it on Facebook. It's such an incredible encouragement. Share. You cannot do the Christian life on your own. Tell a trusted friend about a way that you are struggling with contentment. Make that a matter of prayer. And then find ways to show sacrificial love. And one of the ways that we have that we can do that right now that I'm so excited about is South Ward. And you may not be aware, the reason we started doing this a couple of years ago, started providing Christmas gifts for South Ward, is because a whole bunch of those kids at that school, that's the poorest school in Longview School District, a whole bunch of those kids in that school will have absolutely nothing for Christmas other than what we give them. It's not a hard thing for us to sacrifice a little bit of money to show God's love. And don't worry, because we'll, once we're through with South Ward, we've got another project coming this Christmas to show love for the orphans, those who are adopted or need to be adopted, and for those who are part of the foster care system that I'm really excited about. Uh, but you'll hear more about that. Participate in that. Participate sacrificially. If you're someone here and you had not grown up in the church and you don't know anything about a relationship with God, but you're hearing this and you're saying, I want to be in relationship with God who pursued me even when I didn't deserve it. The next step for you is to talk to anyone who's been on this stage or anyone who will be up here in a few moments when we're done. And let us introduce you to that love. If you're a new Christian and you're looking at this passage and you're saying, these principles are helpful, but they are so hard and I don't know how to apply them to my lives. Again, come talk to someone who's up here and let us help you. Or, or write on your care card that you want help applying the principles and, and put it in one of the boxes that are in the foyer. And if you're someone who's been walking with the Lord for a long time, pay attention. Who are the people who are around you that need help applying these principles? and living out the love that they have received from Christ. Pay attention and help. We're going to wrap up here. We're going to do something a little bit different. Um, we are going to go to a baptism. In fact, if you have not, if you're getting baptized and you have not left yet, you need to go now. <laughs> Run, fast. Um, no, you're okay. Uh, I'll juggle, I'll keep talking, I'll do something. Um, you're good. Um, we're going to go to a baptism, and here's how this is going to work. We're going to wrap up in prayer, and we're going to give you 10 minutes for those who want to wander outside and watch the baptism outside. You are very welcome to do that. And this is a gorgeous day. This is one of those days I wish we had a retractable roof. Um, we're going to invite you to do that. And if you'd prefer to stay inside and stay in your comfortable seat, um, you can do that because we will have a video feed that will show the baptism as well. Why do we baptize people? Because these are people who are making the declaration that they want to be characterized by what we talked about this morning. They are followers of Christ who want their lives to be an imitation of God and a reflection of the love that they have received from Christ. And we as a church are saying, and we stand by them and support them in that journey. That's why we do this. It's a very, very powerful declaration to that end. Um, I'm going to close in prayer, and I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward, and I'm going to give one other piece of instruction. During the 10-minute break that we have for, allows you to move outside, if you have children in children's ministry, could you please go get them in that 10 minutes and bring them over to watch the baptism? The reason for that is the teachers, many of them who are teachers of people who are getting baptized, can't come watch the baptism if there are children there. And they would like to be able to come watch the baptism, and we would like for them to be able to. So if you have children in children's ministry, if you could go use this 10 minutes to go get them, that would be wonderful. If you don't have children in children's ministry, you can stop by the South Ward uh, desk out there and sign up for that. And we'll also have that open at the very end.
Would you stand with me and pray? And prayer team, if you are here, if you could come forward and pray for those who want to come and talk about next steps or talk or just share ways that we can be praying for them. That's why we're here. Heavenly Father, we are reminded in your word that the fundamental truth about who we are is that we are your beloved children. And we have a world that says that is not the true us. Who we truly are is what we accomplish. Who we truly are is, is who we know. Who we truly are is what we own. But those things will pass away. Who we truly are are your beloved children. Because of that, Lord, because we are empowered by that and motivated motivated by that, Lord. We ask that you would help us today to live as imitators of you, reflections of your love that you have given us through your son. And we ask for your help in doing that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You are dismissed. We'll start in 10 minutes. Go grab children. Sign up for South Ward. Go outside or stay in here. <laughs>